Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Josef N. Greg. Josef is maybe to many of you unknown and is a relative newcomer to the scene, but he's been active in photography for quite a while. And uh, the level of his work is a uh, testament to what he has managed to achieve in these uh, little years that he's been in photography. And he's also a testament that you can never start late enough. Photography is something which is, to me, a universal language which anyone can pick up and go if you are committed and dedicated to it. Josef Grek is an, an outdoor adventure and travel photographer, and he's currently based in Switzerland, despite being Maltese. He's in Switzerland for work purposes, obviously. He is 57 years old, but thankfully much fit, much fitter than that. He looks much younger. Oh, Josef. <laughs> And uh, he's been uh, interested in photography since his childhood, but he only got into photography about three years ago, and he actually decided to go into it semi-professionally. Uh, Yosef has a very evident passion for the outdoors. He's a very keen mountaineer, and he also does scuba diving, which is how I came across uh, Yosef, although I had met him before through, through my work. And his main subject matter is obviously seeing these interests uh, landscape and wildlife photography, although recently he's also branching out into drone photography and underwater photography as well. As I said, he, he likes to take his equipment wherever he goes, which is usually to extremes, he's either up on a mountain peak, so high up, or deep down into the depth, so he's exploring both ends of the spectrum. So without further ado, I give you Josef Grek, and I wish him all the best for his talk. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, um, and thank you also to the to you, Charles, and to the Institute for giving me this opportunity to to share with you what is more of a personal journey, which is why I chose the title as I did, a personalized view of the natural world. Um, because like every photographer and every artist, and you are all testament to this, we always give our touch to what we perceive you know, through the lenses of our cameras. So um, I chose this title specifically because I wanted to share with you uh, the story of my journey, which actually um, I chose, I prepared this slide as a starter intentionally because there was a beginning and I call it the child voice within. Um, so when I was, um, I, I don't think I probably, uh, even probably before my teens, and that's cool. I mean, here you have a collection. I had I had started off with a brownie, a Kodak brownie, and then on the top right you can see my first 35 millimeter camera. And on the on the on the surface there you have photographs. There there's me in the middle of a school outing with the with the brownie. I think that was in Ardalam actually. And on the side there are some photos I had taken and even developed at school um, as part of photography as a sort of extra project. So I'll come to this slide later on at the very end because, you know, the, the seeds were there as a child and I really wanted to go into photography. I, I, I come from a very simple family, so the truth is I could not afford to, to buy certain equipment. I used to dream a lot at the beginning. And then as the years went by, and these I call these the intermediate years. This was when I started like getting uh, cameras. So I started with the Pentax ME Super and then I went to an Olympus and then I got a Nikon D80 and then I left the SLRs because quite bluntly I broke them and uh, I got a few compacts. I think I had a Canon G12 and then I played around with a few GoPros. But in this time, I tried as much as possible with the equipment I had to produce some images like this one, which is one of my favorites, which could really, you know, um, express the photographic passion inside. But I could never really um, take this like to its full potential. And at the same time, as a child, I also felt that I had this taste for adventure, which I just couldn't put my finger on. Um, I mean, it was limited to going camping sometimes. Again, then I took up diving, which was, you know, sort of the most exciting thing I could do. Um, but again, there was this child voice within, which was telling me something. And then, as, as we can all appreciate, life sometimes takes you away. You have responsibilities, you know, um, family sometimes. And you couldn't really, you couldn't, you, you cannot really 
listen to that voice which is inside. However, in 2009, I, um, I, things started to change. And uh, in preparation for Kilimanjaro, you know, Kilimanjaro was a series of climbs which was organized for philanthropic purposes. Um, and, and that year, I, I was leading the team that year in 2009. And this preparation to Kilimanjaro, we decided to climb Etna. Um, it was the second attempt actually by a Maltese team because the first Maltese team had got lost and had needed to be rescued. And we organized uh, an expedition, I think it was somewhere around June, to climb um, the, the volcano. Looking back, we were ill-prepared and, uh, and it was very dangerous. In fact, I will not do it again because when I think about all the things which could have happened, uh, first of all, when we climbed up, we were thinking we were going to sleep in a refugio and then we had found it completely burnt down because of a recent eruption. Luckily, we had tents. It was bitterly cold. And, uh, but again, the next day, we, we, we slept overnight there at 500 meters from the summit. And then the next day, we managed to reach the crater, as you can see this picture there. Um, obviously, climbing it, and I have to be careful from the, with, with the wind direction because the fumes are extremely acidic. Uh, and again, so it was downright dangerous. But anyway, we did it. We were the first Maltese to, to reach the top, and it was a very nice experience. Still, I managed to get this one shot, which was the night before. This is the, the night before when I said it was freezing cold. There was this cloud formation, uh, which I thought was quite unique. And uh, so, I, I mean, the landscape is, is lunar, as you can see. And uh, this is my uh, parting shot from, from Mount Etna in 2009. In, later on that year, in September, I had the opportunity of leading again another team to Kilimanjaro. And um, this is a, a shot. I mean, I'm not going to bore you with summit pictures, but this is a shot I took from the top. There's a glacier on top. And I chose this uh, extract from Ernest Hemingway's um, Snows of Kilimanjaro. And what I like most about this, um, this, uh, these few sentences is the last one that no one, so they, they're, they're, apparently they're close to the Western summit. Hemingway says that there is a dead, dead uh, dried and frozen carcass of a leopard and no one has explained what the leopard was seeking at that altitude. And for me, the leopard represents this thing in mountaineering, which sometimes even we mountaineers find it hard to understand the why we do it. We gain a certain pleasure out of it. Um, and the leopard for me is uh, an example of that kind of person seeking something as they climb mountains. I, um, I have these two photographs. The one on the right is from Kilimanjaro, and that is Mount Meru in the distance. We were about two or three days from the summit here. And the one on the left is actually in Switzerland. That's a mountain I climbed last year, uh, Pitzpalu. And I put these two pictures here because for me, they represent the magic of, of the mountains. Even today, if someone had to ask me, but why? I cannot really answer this question. It's just, it's just um, such a nice allure to go up into the mountains and be up there. Perhaps it's the solitude. Perhaps it's the fact that you're away from civilization. But uh, perhaps it's the danger, I don't know. But um, I chose these two photographs here just to represent this kind of magic, which um, mountaineers tend to feel in their heart. Um, after Kilimanjaro, it sort of sparked something off in me. And there I did, an, I continued, I took up mountaineering quite seriously, uh, quite late, because I think at that time I was in my mid to late 40s. And uh, so I climbed Tupkal in Morocco in 2012. Then in, uh, in 13, I happened to be in Montenegro and I climbed their highest mountain there. Uh, then I moved to Italy for work purposes. And uh, again, Italy was relatively restricted in terms of climbing because they're not that high, but I did Monte Legnone in 2016 uh, together with my son. And that's the picture on the bottom left. I did the Tour de Mont Blanc, which is basically we started off in France. We trekked, I think, 172 kilometers down into Italy, back up into Switzerland and down again to France. But the next key mountain I climbed was a Concagua, and that was in 2013. And again, you might tell me, where is the photography here? But I'll come to it in a second. 
Um, these were part of the intermediate years where I was trying to take the best type of images with the equipment I had at the time. A was 6,961. And I did not summit it because 500 meters from the summit, uh, at around well, about 400 meters, because I reached 6,500, I got hit by altitude sickness and I had to retreat. Altitude sickness can be a killer. Um, however, once you start to go down, I mean, I went down 300 meters and I was fine. But obviously, um, it marked the first mountain when I wanted to get to the top, but I didn't. But that was a very formative experience because it made me eat humble pie and realize what climbing was all about. It's not about reaching the summit. This is the south face of Aconcagua. As you can see, it's a completely different kettle of fish. I celebrated my 50th birthday in front of the summit. Uh, because I didn't want to have a cake and candles for my 50th, so I decided to, to go off to South America. Um, and as I said, I mean, this mountain really framed for me uh, and made me ask a lot of questions. Is it ego driven? Is the summit so important? And all these types of questions. So I'm very grateful to Aconcagua. One point I want to mention, because I'm going to come to this when we talk about taking photography in adventure settings, are the conditions um, that basically you're in. So you're in a hostile environment, you're very often in a tent, and uh, and it's, it's uh, I mean, it's to, this was a, a nice sunny day, but the day before, I mean, we had winds which were super, super strong, and the tent was literally bashing from one side to the next. Um, but the point I want to make here is that uh, there are there's more than one challenge to be faced at the same time and your living conditions and the environmental conditions are, are one of them. Again, this is probably uh, one of the most luxurious loos that exist in the world, because this is a loo on Aconcagua with this fantastic view um, from the moments where you are so intricately in contact with nature in the bathroom. But as things very often happen, images say one thing and reality is another, because as you can see, the actual loo itself was not as romantic as the scene from the little black hole. And this was actually just a cistern. And there you are sitting there, um, you know, and uh, admiring the view from this little black hole. But, but this goes to show you again, the type of conditions that uh, one tends to find himself on, on these types of expeditions. Again, uh, the scenery in the mountain thing is fantastic. Um, this is just one of the sunsets. Um, so apart from the mountain views, you also get these very lovely moments where you have no Wi-Fi signal, you're completely alone. And, and that has, um, you know, the, the, the beauty of itself. So in 2017, I moved to Switzerland for work reasons and there things changed completely. Um, I, uh, I took the decision then to take up photography seriously. So I invested quite a lot of money into some equipment. Not that I believe it's the equipment which makes the photograph, but it's the photographer which does. But obviously the equipment allows you more flexibility to produce a certain quality of images, which otherwise you might not be able to, to produce. That's the Eiger uh, North face there which is a very famous mountain. Um, I obviously being in Switzerland, then I had the opportunity of doing quite a lot of climbing. In 2019, I did two 4,000 meters. Uh, last year I did Pitz Palu, and hopefully in three weeks time, I'm going to have a shot at another mountain called Pitz Mortaraj, which is 3,751. Again, Switzerland gave me the opportunity to really let myself go and, uh, you know, from an image creation point of view. And it really spoils the eye. This is this is a place in Engadin, which Engadin is in the eastern part of Switzerland, where I spend a lot of my time. I live in central Switzerland, but I tend to spend a lot of my time in the eastern part of Switzerland um, because of the mountainous area there. This is Pitz Bernina on the, on the left. You can see what is known as the Biancorad, which is the snowy ridge which is there all year round. And uh, 
this mountain on the right hand side is actually Pitts Mortarach, which is the one I want to climb in three weeks time. Uh, hopefully, if the weather is good, I'm planning to get a shot of this um, of this snow ridge, the Biancorad, from the top of Mortarach, but we'll see. I mean, it all depends on the weather and uh, and on the conditions on that day. This again is another one. I, I love the shadows here and the contrast between white, uh, black, or gray, and blue. This is in central Switzerland. And um, this again is in Engadin, a different part, because Engadin is very close to Italy, and this is close to this, what is known as the Bernina Pass. And what I really liked about this was the, the fact that you have ice in front, you have a little bit of reflection, and then you have the lovely blue contrasting sky, sky on top. Uh, again, back to Engadin, this is um, those mountains and the clouds there, that's Pitz Palu. That's the, that's the mountain I did last year. And this is the Mortaraj Glacier. Um, whilst we're on this, I, I, I feel I must put in a little bit of an environmental message here, because since I've been in Switzerland, I've, I've obviously I go to these glaciers quite often. And once you go there once, twice, three times, and you study them a little bit, you realize how they are retreating at an impressive, at an impressive rate. I mean, in, um, in June, I usually go on a refresher course to um, uh, a, a glacier on the Susten Pass, which is called Stein Glacier. And in one year, it retreated about 250 meters. The I mean, I remember where I was last year, Last year I was on ice and then I come back and now I'm on, on, on rocks. And it's really, it's really impressive. I mean, the Swiss sometimes tend to cover the glaciers even with white plastic in summer so that the sun reflects and doesn't melt. But it's, um, I mean, it's literally sand going through our hands huh? because it's, it's a bit sad to be honest with you to see this and highlights the importance that we take measures to combat global warming. Again, mountains often produce the opportunity for drama. And this is one of my favorite photos in the sense that you have your black and white, the clouds, and it creates this sense of mystery. And again, the Matterhorn, which again, this was taken in summer. It, it, obviously, it was. this is a black and white um, uh, image, as you can see. It, I think this is the most iconic mountain um, representing both the country and chocolate. Uh, but but this is really nice, and there's a hut which is about uh, probably about a thousand meters from the summit where you can sleep in, and uh, and uh, the, from where most of the mountaineers leave to re to reach the summit. It is also one of the most dangerous mountains and has claimed a number of fatalities. Also because of global warming, the permafrost is melting and the rock tends to detach now. So you really have to be very careful when you're climbing this mountain. So. Let's, I wanted to talk a little bit just briefly on the challenges facing the adventure photographer kind of thing, the outdoor photographer and the ropes of the game, the pun not intended. But I put here four pictures which represent what I would really like to, to express. So the one on the top left, there are the guides in Kilimanjaro and they are weighing all the equipment for the porters to carry up. And one of the key challenges I face is weight. Because not only do I have my normal equipment, which is sim exemplified in the picture in the middle. So basically, I have my gear, I have my shoes, I have my crampons, I have the ropes, I have my backpack, which contains, you know, my emergency supplies and this and that, and also my camera. So very often I feel I, I am, it's a bit of a heart wrench actually, because I have to decide, and very often I decide just to take one lens, which is very often a wide angle lens. Uh, a zoom actually I have a 14 to 24 and that's it because even um, as I'm going to say later I have a Nikon D850 which isn't exactly light uh, and I have to take this decision mm -hmm. the other thing uh, one has to consider and this is at the bottom left are the temperatures it gets bitterly cold I mean I that at that time when I took that photo I actually went on a lake um, in Engadin close to St Moritz and the temperature was minus 18. And this plays havoc even on your on the batteries of the camera, on the camera itself. So there are, I mean, obviously you can keep your cameras, your batteries warm. I just put them in a sock and I put them in my jacket, you know, in my mid layer. 
but still, I mean, these are the things one has to to face. And then obviously there are the surroundings because the surroundings aren't always, I mean, this is a nice photo. I was in a tent where we had gone uh, with uh, snowshoes and the weather was good. Again, at night it became bitterly cold because when you have those clear blue skies, it gets even colder. Sometimes with a bit of cloud, it's warmer, but the conditions are hostile. And uh, I mean, it, I don't mean to say it's, it's not possible, but they're all things that one has to keep in mind. This is one example. For example, I wanted to, I found this ice cave in Morterach and I really wanted to get some shots, but it, intrinsically it is, it is effectively dangerous. Um, so um, I actually climbed into the, the ice cave. Um, there you can see me on the bottom right bending over. A friend of mine who was with me took the shot. I didn't know she was, she was taking the picture, but and then, this is the result which from this is one of my favorite photos. This is, um, you know, a, a high resolution picture of the ice wall. And uh, uh, I mean, this I'm actually I'm actually going to have this printed on high definition paper and then they're going to cover it with a sh small layer of acrylic. And I think it will look very nice. I mean, I'm, I'm very happy with this image. This is the, the ice wall on the side of the cave. This is another shot I took in the cave. Um, and then obviously black and white abstract. Um, this is the ice ice, ice, ice uh, surfaces. There's a bit of snowy ice here. It's not completely blue ice like the ones we saw before. Another example was this one. This is uh, basically, I had found this ice shelter. I, I was actually um, training, going for a, a, a a run in the mountains and I found this ice shelter and I decided to to spend the night there. So again, I mean, as I'm saying, it's not only a question of of your photography, but it's also a question of having your equipment and surviving. I mean, I really wanted to cook my own food because for me, this was a bit of a test. Um, I was OK from a heat point of view because I researched the type of insulation that I needed. And in this particular case, it was also a psychological game because it was the first night I actually spent all alone in the mountains, um, you know, sleeping in this ice shelter. It went very well. The feeling of satisfaction I had the next morning was great. I managed to take these shots. They're not much, um, but this was, so I, I actually went out at night. Um, inside the igloo, it wasn't that cold. The temperatures were hovering around zero. Outside, it was about minus eight or minus nine. But I took these, um, these two shots. Uh, and also the, the the roof of the igloo intrigued me and uh, I, I just, so this is all I have to report from this famous night in the mountains alone um, uh, in the igloo. I've, there are, so that's basically the mountaineering side and, uh, but there are other areas which I obviously like to, to, to explore. When I was in uh, Tanzania to do Kilimanjaro, I went to Ngorongoro Crater. And there, obviously, the wildlife is, is really spectacular. I think I had at that time a 105 with a times to converter. So I was really at the edge of my limit. But still, I managed to get some shots, which I'm very happy about. And, uh, uh, and, and again, that was quite a unique experience, which I'd love to return now with a, with a much better lens, medium telephoto at least. Coming back to Switzerland. Again, spending a lot of time in the mountains without wanting to sound overly romantic. I, um, you actually get to know the mountains in the sense that you get to, to sense the seasons a bit better. You start to study the animals and their behavior. You know that in certain times of the year, the animals are in certain areas and they have certain habits. And one of my favorite uh, subjects are the Steinbocks. These are the alpine ibex. They're extremely gentle creatures. Um, they're also hunted in Switzerland, but hunting is highly regulated. But every time I find Steinbocks, I sort of feel sorry because they're so, I mean, they let, if you are careful, they let you approach them gently and you can get some pretty nice shots. I mean, this was a herd which had come down. They, they tend to come down, first of all, only at the beginning of summer, not in midsummer because in midsummer it's too hot, they come down from the mountains to graze on the freshly exposed grass. So they come down in the evenings and there are certain spots where they tend to, 
to congregate. And if you know more or less where these spots are, you can get some very interesting shots. This is also one of my, actually, I think this is my favorite time book um, photograph. Um, um, as I said, I mean, these are majestic animals. This is a male. The, the ones with the huge horns are the males. And they say the ridges in the horns depict the number of years um, that the, the Steinbock has. So before I continue what's in my bag, let me just tell you a little bit what, um, so how, so when I, again, as I said, about three or four years ago, I, I decided to take this very seriously. I bought myself a Nikon D850. I have three lenses, 14 to 24, 24 to 70, and, and 70 to 200. I have a times two converter lens. And then this year, because I did not travel and I managed to put some money aside, I bought myself two things. I bought um, an underwater housing for the Nikon, which is a Nauticam and, uh, with a glass dome. And I bought myself a drone. And um, again, underwater photography was not something completely new to me because I had, I think it was in 2017, traveled to Tonga in the Pacific. And at that time I had an Olympus Tough with a wet lens. So I had to basically in the water, remove the wide angle, let water in, close it, and then I could take pictures. Uh, the advantage in Tonga is that in September, the, the whales are extremely uh, docile in the sense that they don't feed. They would have actually, these are humpback whales, by the way, they would have migrated from the Antarctica to give birth and, and raise their young calves. Uh, and then once the calves are raised, they migrate back to Antarctica, where they start to feed. And these are the famous pictures you see sometimes of humpback whales feeding with their huge mouths, um, swallowing lots of water. But in Tonga, um, so when you have, for example, a mother and a the calf, they're so gentle that they actually let you approach them. The, um, the picture on the left was a, a bit of a different story because I was in the water. Uh, I could see that the whale is approaching me and I, I started to try to frame the shot. And then in the very last minute, the whale flipped and, and went down below me. But uh, it was at least I managed to get the shot, which, which I'm, I'm very happy with. Um, this is another shot of the whales. This is, this is, so you have the mother on the horizontal position and then you have the, the calf, which is down. You have... Uh, the, the cleaner fish there who uh, who feed on the surface of the skin of the of the whales. Uh, so so again, underwater photography, as I said before, I had played around a little bit. Um, uh, but this time now with the new housing, I'm hoping to get some even better shots. This is another one. So in this case, this is actually a calf because the calves are extremely curious and they come up to you. They come up to you. Another situation you might find with humpback whales, and I've experienced this, but I have no image, and I'll tell you why, is that towards the end of the season, you get what are known as heat runs. And heat runs are, so basically the, the, the females would have given birth, and, and, and some of them would have basically reared their young, and it's almost time to start mating again. So what happens is you can get, I mean, these whales are as large as a bendibus, just to give you some idea of scale. Um, so what happens is you have a group of males, like, for example, eight males chasing one female and and they're called heat runs. So you see them in the water and they're swimming and swimming and swimming fast. And what we did was we went with the Zodiac. You try to intercept them. You go into the water and they pass right through you. And it's extremely exciting because, first of all, the speed, the size, then the males start to blow bubbles as they're going through to disrupt the other males. And it's super exciting. The reason why I don't have an image was because my camera had a wet lens and I did not have time in the water to take the lens out, put it back on, frame the shot and take it. But it was still a nice experience. Going back closer to home, this is in Malta uh, and this is in Chircoa. You, The divers of you recognize that this is the Rosie. I always tend to more or less go to the same places because, I mean, I basically dive for fun. Uh, now I, I would want to, when I come to Malta, perhaps explore a, a few new places again. I mean, I used to dive quite extensively um, about 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Now I just go there, you know, just to enjoy the dive and very often end up in Chircoa. But again, um, these are two shots 
which were taken, the one on the left with the Olympus and the one on the right recently with, with the Nikon. Uh, without strobes, obviously, that's why it's so blue, because obviously there's no color correction. And uh, I also tried apnea. This is not me. This is actually my instructor. I tried apnea and to see how the dynamics are. First of all, how I react, you know, as a, you know, holding my breath underwater and, and also handling my buoyancy because you have to put on weights just as in diving and the buoyancy of the camera. So I went to Gozo for, for two days when I was in Malta and I had already um, taken a course in apnea last year. But I wanted to do it again because I'm planning to go back to Tonga hopefully next year, uh, COVID permitting. And in Tonga, you cannot use scuba. You just have to rely on your breath. So so uh, I, I do plan to train a little bit here in Switzerland, although diving in a lake is completely different to diving in the sea. It's, it's, it's far from enjoyable. But but this is the plan at least for, for, for next year. So this was a shot I tried. This was my instructor coming up from the from the, the line below. And um, so when I was in Malta, I also tried split shots. And uh, this is this is my daughter and we were in Comino. And I'm beginning to discover that underwater, it's like I'm back to kindergarten again. I need to learn everything again. So, so with split shots, there are two things which I have started to be challenged with. Uh, one, I think I have the solution. The second one, I don't ha have yet. So the first one is the point of focus. So I found, so I use single point of focus. And obviously it's very hard. I mean, I have another picture of this with, with my daughter standing in the water where half her torso is up and half her torso is underwater. And it's very hard to get the camera to, to focus. I mean, I think the best place to focus is above water, but, and then you lose underwater. I'm still playing around with F number to try to get a good depth of field at the same time to get a bit of speed because obviously then I will lose, you know, clarity. And the second challenge, as you can see, the clouds have got this little like ring. And that is basically a little bit of water on the dome. Um, so uh, the place I bought the dome from here in Switzerland, they told me, listen, you should use your saliva to cover this up. I tried it, it didn't really work. Uh, I'm still working on this, you know, to get, so that when I take the dome out of the water, the water slips off gently and I can get clarity. Still, I managed to get this shot and I, I got this, this, by the way, this shot was inspired by a similar shot by Kurt Arrigo. Um, I went a second time because the first time the focus was completely out of this world. And then I thought a little bit about it. And the way I solved it was that I focused on the sand right in front of me. And like that, I, I, so basically I put down the, the spot focusing and I focused on the sand right in front of me. And that gave me uh, a much better, a much better shot. Again, Switzerland, COVID, uh, a bit of boredom, and I bought myself a Mavic Pro 2. Uh, this is, these are some of the first images I took, and it's not bad actually. I mean, it's got a small, it has a one-inch sensor, uh, it's got a Hasselblad lens, uh, but it's pretty crisp. It's pretty crisp for what it is. The reason I bought the Mavic 2 Pro is that it is foldable and I can take it with me up in the mountains because, I mean, I, I'm a bit of a nerd on specifications. I like to research a lot. Probably if I had to have a Phantom 4, it would give me slightly better results, but this was, was not too bad considering. And here is a top shot I took on the first time I tried it out. So I went up in the mountains. I made sure that there was no one around. I mean, in Switzerland, you have to have a third party liability insurance which is not cheap because they insist that you have at least a liability of 5 million. I mean, I don't know how I can make, you know, create damage, which cross, cross, costs 5 million, but this is the condition, but I took it out. And as you can see, so I just took the drone up, that's me there in the middle between the two grass spots. And it's, it's pretty sharp, it's pretty sharp. Back in Malta, this was in Comino, I tried it out, a top shot. Um, Dweira, you recognize this, and again, I mean, considering so, so I was actually, I was actually somewhere here, on the left hand side. But considering, uh, considering the height, considering the the size of the camera, I thought it's it's pretty good. Uh, again, then I flew the drone 
between the wall and fungus rock. I mean, it's not a wow photo, and I should have waited perhaps half an hour more for the sun to descend a bit more, but I wanted to get this effect, and uh, it was more of a trial more than anything else. And this is actually my favorite shot. It's a bit abstract. So this was in Comino. It's the Blue Lagoon. I just flew up, I tilted the camera down, and I took a shot. And this is the water uh, over the sand, and I think this is probably one of my favorite one so far. Again, in Switzerland, I tried a little bit of everything. I tried a bit of astrophotography um, with mixed success. Uh, I still need to, to work a bit more on this. Again, here the challenge is going out at night in freezing temperatures more than the photography itself. But anyway, it was, it was fun, and that's the Milky Way um, at a place called the Avoletza. Some long exposure shots. Again, tripod and, and long exposure just to get this feel of movement. This is a this is a small waterfall close to where I stay in Graubunden. And obviously, as winter approaches, it starts to freeze up. But I want to get this contrast between the ice and the flowing water. But again, Switzerland and I think perhaps the most of my photographs are landscape photography. I mean, Switzerland spoils me in this respect. Um, Sometimes I feel I'm not the photographer, but it's nature which is showing itself off. Uh, this is a lake close to St. Moritz. This is another one. I mean, here you have to climb a little bit until you get here. And in this case, the, the exposure challenged me a little bit. This is called Oceans here. Again, this is um, uh, on the way on the way to Italy. There's a, what is known as Lago Bianco, and this was. A, and again, it's funny. You start to learn the season, so you know what one season can present and what another can present. Like this is exactly you know when when the the, the water starts almost starts to freeze up, but it's not yet it's not yet winter. Then again, I mean the artistic eye, which I'm sure you can all relate to. Sometimes you see something, you see a design, beauty is in there of the beholder. And uh, and this is, for example, a, a very fresh snowfall, which I had taken. And I, I mean, I really like the shapes and the contours and the shadows here. Again, reflection of trees with snow in, in the lake. And again, I mean, you either like these images or you don't, because it's a question, it's a question of perception. Blauze, which is Blue Lake for, for obvious reasons. This was taken in autumn. And, uh, and uh, again, autumn again. This was not taken with the drone because I didn't have the drone at that time. I was actually on the other side of the mountain and I used my 200 millimeter to, to get this shot as the sun was setting. It's, it's, I, I find the colors very interesting. Back again to, to Engadin and the reflections of of uh, the mountains and trees and the lakes. The patterns here of, uh, of the snow on, on conifer trees, which, which are, are pretty common in that part of Switzerland. And again, this was taken with the Olympus, by the way, not with the Nikon, but this is probably one of my most, um, actually my friends tell me this is one of the shots they like the most about Engadin. Um, this was early morning because the sun rises just behind my back. And, uh, and it, I think it was sometime around October. And uh, this was taken almost close to New Year's Eve with the Nikon uh, two years ago. I was driving down to Bolzano and I realized that there's this certain, time of certain type of climatic conditions when you get these icicles forming on the twigs. And, and again, I mean, this, this for me represents what we say in photography, you either capture it then and you cannot go back and recapture the moment because the conditions will change and you will never get the same. So you really need to get it when it presents itself. Um, autumn again, uh, this is another lake in close to St. Moritz. And, uh, and this is um, in, in, in Engadin on the way to Italy on the other side. Uh, this was taken with a graduated uh, filter um, and uh, so I had a polarizing filter, I had a graduated filter, and it was a bit of a long exposure. You can see the clouds on top that they're like, uh, you know, like smudged out and you see the reflection in the water. But um, I thought it produced a pretty cool effect, especially contrasting with the snow on the side and the, the light hitting the snow from the right hand side. Again, in Switzerland, it snows, at least where I am, it snows heavily. And this was more of an artistic shot 
you know, um, black and white with the snow and the gray. And I thought I thought it looked nice. Back to back to Engadin. Um, here, the lake I showed you before is now completely frozen and covered in snow. I had the opportunity once when it was ice with no snow and that was quite rare but i managed to get a shot this is quite an iconic tree you tend to see it a lot in travel brochures unfortunately it had another branch on the right hand side but it got damaged in a storm but um, so that's the same lake uh, frozen and covered with ice and i'm coming to the end of my presentation i took this photo close to home one morning um, i was actually out running and i took this phone with my iphone um, but for me, it really, there's a photographer there, as you can see. And uh, I really like this photo because it's, um, I mean, the photographer there really symbolizes, you know, all, all these things we love to do. Sometimes we wake up at odd times of the day and, you know, uh, to just to get the shot. And, and I thought, you know, this, I should include this in the presentation. So a little bit of behind the scenes. Um, Behind every successful photographer is an even more successful assistant. Um, this is Rusty. Uh, he's not my dog, but I've sort of adopted him. There he is sleeping on a ton of equipment, which costs more than him and me put together. Um, but um, on a lighter note, Rusty is always at the right place at the right time. So this was when, for example, the lake I showed you before was ice. And I mean, the dog was there. And as you can see, my shoes, it's, it's a very surreal feeling. You're walking on the ice and you can see the bottom because it's literally like gl glass. And I set myself on the surface and the dog was coming in front, in front of the lens. And then he, he po she posed exactly where I wanted to take the shot. But thanks to Rusty, we got this. And this is the same lakes I've been showing you before, but in different uh, conditions. This only happened once in about three or four winters that it actually froze up it didn't snow and you get this like black ice kind of kind of effect but rusty is always there so uh, i'm very grateful for i mean this was taken in the tent when i showed you that picture earlier on uh, with the snowshoes and all that it was nice it was nice to have the dog in the tent so this is my last slide and um first of all i i i need to to mention a few things. First of all, I want to a special thanks to, to the child voice within because, and this is perhaps a bit of a personal statement, um, I'm appreciative of the fact that I had the opportunity to reconnect with the things as a young boy I wanted to do and I dreamt of and I had the opportunity to do so. And I think this is one of the reasons why photography gives me so much pleasure. It's because it's basically a childhood dream. Um, special thanks to my son, Tim, who is actually the sort of digital media manager, um, and he took care of setting up my website and all this and all that. I have to mention Kurt Arrigo here, who is both a friend and a mentor. Um, Kurt has supported me a lot in, in going forward. And, and again, I mean, one of the reasons why I appreciate Kurt's mentorship is that he never told me what to do, but he tried to help me like a true mentor discover it myself. And last but not least, I would like to thank you all. I would like to thank Charles, who approached me in the first place, and 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 the institute for accepting, you know, um, me to present these shots this evening. And I, I I end on a bit of a philosophical note. I mean, I asked myself two questions. The first one was, what makes a true mountaineer? You know, is it the is it the conquering of summits? You know, is it the ego driven? Uh, drive to to bag more and more mountains, or is it actually the mastery of the earth and the enjoyment of doing it for its own sake? And on similar lines, I ask myself, what makes a true photographer? And with that question, I end my presentation. I leave. I let you think, and because I'm sure you have your opinions on what makes a true photographer. And um, I thank you really very, very much. And um, I look forward to any questions you might have or comments.